welcome to worship here at Foothills United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Brad. I have the privilege of leading all of us uh, together as we worship the Lord in truth and in spirit. Glad you're here. Someone mentioned this morning to me that COVID's back. I thought, well, COVID never left, I think. I think it's still sticking around here. So not the ideal situation that we would prefer, but we want to certainly be in compliance with the state mandates. And also, if we're putting this service up on YouTube for the whole world to see, it's easy for them to see, wait, the choir's not wearing masks. That's $1,000 per person, so we're sending you the bill. So uh, I get it. Um, but we also want to be safe, and part of being a Christian is, is loving your neighbor. And so we do that because we love each other, and we want to take care of each other and be safe. So busy week for you, for me, for everyone, is it is Christmas week. It's happening Friday night, 7 o'clock, Friday night at 7, right here in this space, Christmas Eve worship service. My first Christmas with you. I'm incredibly excited. We got the choir singing. We got the bell choir performing. Uh, great message. Beautiful atmosphere. There's something really holy about Christmas Eve. So we pray that you're able to join us, whether here or online. Bring your friends. Bring your family. Fill the place up. And to God be the glory. So we're excited about that. We will be here next Sunday as well. Two worship services again as we celebrate uh, Christmas that continues. So. Glad you're here. Um, glad to be here. I'm going to invite Light, Lisa and Mike to come forward and read their Advent reading for us so we can light the candles this morning. Lisa and Mike. Uh, <laughs> Just as he promised our ancestors. 
Sometimes when we are trying something new or when we are facing a difficult decision or when we want to celebrate something or when we just feel lost and alone and uncertain about life, the universe and everything we need a, bless a blessing. We don't always think of it that way or reward it like that. We say we need advice or support or companions or someone to come along beside and lift us up again so we can see more than the tops of our shoes. We seek a blessing. For many of us, we go home, we ask mom, we talk to dad, or brothers and sisters, close friends, those we grew up with, those who know us best. We want them alongside us. We want to be in their presence. Somehow, we know that being there, being home, will make all things better. Maybe it won't be fixed, or solved, or wished away, but at least we won't be alone. We seek a blessing. Mary faced with an incomprehensible burden and gift, ran to President Elizabeth House, looking for someone who knew a little of what she was going through, looking for a place to hide until the reality of her condition could become something real, and she received a blessing. The prophet Micah spoke of a blessing coming to an unexpected place and unassuming time, yet by God's grace would become the means through which God would bless the whole world, Bethlehem, the little town of blessing. We seek a blessing. We light these candles, the candle of hope, of peace, of joy, and of today. Love, as a sign that we know blessing, and we know waiting for blessing to be felt and lived. We light these candles as a sign that we still seek a blessing. It's time to go home. Thank you folks, much appreciated. You probably have learned by now that I make these readings just long enough so the flame goes out at the exact moment you're supposed to light the candle, so. It worked perfectly, so thank you for that. We are blessed to be a blessing. That's why we take up an offering to help us to again, clothe those who are naked, to feed the hungry, to help those who have no heat, to help those who have no friends. We are blessed to be a blessing. Can't forget my Christmas joke. Okay. Um, riddle. Uh, what did the gingerbread man put on his bed? What did the gingerbread man put on his bed? I see a hand raised, maybe. A cookie sheet. Thank you. A cookie sheet. They don't get any better, I promise you, so. <laughs> As we take this morning's offering, we have the plates in front of us. I see there's already um, some gifts there. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the ability you give us to do ministry in Jesus' name. Uh, let's pray for this morning's offering. Lord God, we owe everything to you. You're the giver of every good and perfect thing in our lives. We are blessed. So Lord, help us today to be a blessing to others. Help us to give cheerfully, willingly, that you may do great things through this church, that we can reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ and show the love of Christ in a tangible, real way. Thank you, God, for these gifts and those who give. May you be glorified through all of it. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Glory to God in the highest. So I, I need some help as your new pastor, I guess. So uh, by Christmas, I'll have been married eight months and one day. So my first Christmas with my wife. So I ask her, as any good husband should, honey, what can I get you? What do you want for Christmas? She said, you don't have to get me anything. So I'm good, right? I don't have to get her anything? Is that, 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 no? I still should get her something. That's so confusing. Just tell me what you want. So being the romantic guy I am, I said, you know what I should do? Instead of getting her another sweater or whatever, we should go somewhere. We should create a beautiful memory together. One of the things I know she's always wanted to do, I've always wanted to do, is go see the Rockettes Christmas show in New York City. And so I got online, I got us tickets, and they were not cheap. And I got them right in the center aisle so the confetti would fall on us. And I'm all excited. We're going to go to the city Friday night. We got a tickets for Saturday. We're going to have a nice dinner, do everything. And we drove to New York City, and I get on my phone, and it says the Rockettes have canceled all of the shows until the new year. So I should get credit for at least a good idea, right? I mean, that, that's, I, I tried, I did something, I tried. I had no plan B, so help, I guess. Um, sometimes it can be a, a stressful time. COVID numbers were the highest I've ever been on Thursday, and we broke that record yesterday. And as I saw, not only the Rockettes show being canceled, but a lot of Broadway being closed down, and I see Restaurants are closing and things are happening. We pray and speak against this pandemic. Uh, it's not the way we would prefer to be living our lives. But in such is the way that we are and we try to mitigate through that and we pray for God's blessing as we navigate those things. I want this Christmas season for you not to be one of anxiety or stress or what in the world should I get. Uh, in the back of my mind, I keep hearing, Christmas is not your birthday. Christmas is not your wife's birthday. It's the birthday of our Savior. So keep that in perspective as we give to each other. Let's make sure we give God our very best offering this year. I want you to take a moment and pray with me today. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for this place we can come together to worship and the freedom to do that. We thank you, Lord God, that you are so loving and so patient and so kind to us. That even when we wander astray, when we, when we do the wrong things, when we fail to act in obedience to you, you never stop loving us. You never stop calling us to yourself with enduring grace and patience. Thank you, God, for that. We don't deserve it. I don't even understand it but it is indeed so very wonderful. We thank you, Lord God, for coming to rescue us while we were yet sinners. We pray, Lord, for this country. We pray for uh, people affected by this pandemic, uh, which is all of us. Uh, we pray, Lord God, that the uh, hospitalizations will, will decrease, the people will remain healthy. We pray, Lord, for the opening again of businesses and restaurants and places of worship that have been shuttered because of this pandemic. Lord, it's, it's been going long, far too long. We know that you are the great physician. You can do wonderful, amazing things through scientists and doctors and leaders. So we pray, Lord, for great leadership in this area. We pray for those who are traveling this week to see family, to friends. Uh, keep them safe, Lord, on the roads. We pray for good weather as uh, this services happen this week. We pray that you will be glorified through the pulpits, through the music, through the relationships that are built. We thank you, God, that you've afforded us this opportunity to reach out to this community in love. We pray, Lord, for those who are feeling lonely or cold, anxiety-ridden, stressed out this holiday. It's not an easy holiday for those who've lost a loved one, those who are going through a hardship with work or relationships. So we pray, Lord God, as we've read earlier, we pray for a blessing, God. We need a blessing in our lives. 
Hear us as we pray. Know our hearts before you, the spoken and unspoken requests that we have. We pray, Lord God, this morning as you've taught each of us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> There's one scripture lesson today, and it comes from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. The branch from Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of night, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious.
are sweet. This morning we're continuing our holiday sermon series entitled The Songs of the Season or Finding Christ in the Carols of Christmas. I, I love singing these Christmas carols. I love that song and the next song and the one after that. Uh, one of the most famous ones, you know, is Away in a Manger. A song that children love to sing for hundreds of years now. Legend tells us that Martin Luther, the great uh, reformer, uh, wrote that song to sing to his children way back in the 16th century. Some historians actually call this, uh, refer to this hymn as Luther's Cradle Hymn. But perhaps you've heard that before. In any case, whenever I sing this old carol, I, I get a picture in my mind's eye of the place where Jesus was born. The particular carol helps me to kind of zero in on that first nativity scene. And today, as we remember these lyrics, I'd like us to, to do exactly that, to kind of focus in, take a few moments and get a good look at the nativity itself to see what we can learn from the special and most holy of places. First verse of that carol talks about the stars in the sky look down where he lay. Talks about the stars above the stable that, that first Christmas evening. The light reminds me of the fact that a couple of years later, God would create another special, very special star, another light, to serve as kind of a, a travel guide for a group of men from the East who had developed an interest in looking for the Christ child. Not only did that star lead those Easterners to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, but then Matthew 2, 9 tells us that the star led these wise men to the exact house where Joseph, Mary, and Jesus were living. And when they located that Christ child, the Bible says, they fell on their knees and worshipped him and gave him costly gifts. These men, these first seekers, rejoiced over the fact that their God had provided them with a remarkably accurate travel guide. They knew they would never have found Christ without that amazing star. And so when I think about that aspect of the nativity, the star to me symbolizes that the fact that God has seen to it that those who diligently seek him will find him. It tells us in Jeremiah 29, 13, if you look for me in earnest, if you're really serious about finding me, the Lord says, I will be found by you. I think most of us here who are Christians, as one myself, I say that when I came to the age when I decided to find Christ, when I wanted to become a Christ follower, God sent these travel guides there to help me to find him. I was 10 years old when I realized I needed to have Jesus forgive my sins and lead me through this thing called life. And it was my Sunday school teacher who successfully guided me through that all-important decision. My parents suggested I meet with a pastor to, to learn more about how to follow Jesus and what it meant to be a disciple. Then after, throughout my life, God sent these other travel guides in to lead me to a deeper relationship with the Son of God. For example, I remember my youth group leaders, Mike and Kathy Martin. I remember my Bible study leaders, Ralph and Darlene Howard. I remember my seminary professors. I remember the decades full, churches full of dear Christian friends, this long list of people who helped me walk closer to God. They showed me the way that I should go. And if you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. The wonderful truth is that when we seek God, he always sends these earthbound stars to guide us to him. Now, your star may have been a parent or a friend or a neighbor or a teacher or a pastor. And you can say, without a doubt, without that person, I never would have found Christ. Today, as you remember that star that shone down on that holiest of nights, that guided those first wise seekers to Jesus, wouldn't it be appropriate for us to, to thank God for the gift of those particular travel guides. Wouldn't it be a great time to just pray and say, thank you, Father, for the people you've brought into my life who've guided me to faith in your son, Jesus. 
You know, I think as we also focus on this Christmas star, we who have found Christ should commit ourselves to sharing our faith whenever possible. We should covenant with God that we will help guide people all that we can, our neighbors, co-workers, family members, guide them to Jesus Christ. Saying something like, God, I'm available. Lord, I'm ready, I'm willing, just call on me like you did that star. Help me to help someone find you, the star of Bethlehem. And as we turn our gaze down from the star to the actual stable itself, I want to remember those lyrics that refer to the place where the cattle are lowing. What's the difference between lowing and mooing? I looked it up yesterday, read about it, still don't understand it. But anyway, the cattle were there, right? This, this place, this typical manger scene looks like that. Now, we sometimes put the wise men in as well, and the wise men weren't there that night. They came a couple years later. It says the wise men came to the house and found the child, not the manger, and found the baby. But we get this manger scene in our mind's eye that, that looks kind of cozy. It's kind of inviting and, and warm, and the candles burning, the, the fresh, clean hay, the glow. It's beautiful. But I can assure you that that stable was anything but quaint, was anything but inviting. It was just like a thousand other stables in first century Israel. It was probably a dark, cold, damp cave, rodent infested, crowded with smelly animals. It was all around a rotten place to give birth to a baby. And I don't know about you, but this makes me just, just kind of stop and wonder. If God could create a star to serve as a travel guide, why couldn't he book a suite at the Bethlehem Hilton, right? Or a private room at the local hospital? I mean, God could have done all of those things. But he made the deliberate choice not to. God intentionally chose a stable as a place for his son to be born and for a very important reason. God wanted his son, he wanted Jesus to experience life as we do. He would literally be God in the same kind of flesh that you and I have. Bill Hybels writes this, he says, Jesus was born in that cold, dark place. Why? Because he had no desire to be sheltered from the harsh realities of life in this fallen world of ours. He wanted to experience human life in all of its blue collar boldness. Paul says a similar thing in Philippians 2. He says, Jesus made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being formed in human likeness. Just try to imagine what that must have been like for our Lord. Jesus had known all he had known up to that very night of Christmas were the sights and smells of heaven. The Bible tells us that heaven is this place full of unimaginable beauty. But when Jesus woke up as a baby, the first thing he saw was that dark, cold cave. The first thing he smelt was, is that urine? No, that's manure. Oh my gosh, right? And, and, and the first thing he heard were animal sounds, not the sound of the singing of angels. The Bible teaches us that when Jesus was in heaven, he could say a word and speak things into existence. Unlimited power was at his disposal, but that first Christmas night, he lay in a manger and he set aside all of that power, which means he had to hope that this teenage mother knew how to change a diaper, would certainly feed him on time, please mom, I'm hungry. Why? Why, why was, what was God's purpose in being born in a stable? Why not, why not be born in a, in a palace or at least someplace remotely like heaven? Why not come to earth as a prince instead of a peasant? Well, the answer we know is this. Palace dwelling princes can't relate to what you and I go through. They don't live where we live. They don't eat like we eat. They don't work like we work or suffer like we suffer. 
I remember when the nation of Kenya was having this democratic elections and the president of Kenya had this very corrupt leader. He was, he was very corrupt and, and our ambassador went to Kenya and says, listen, we're going to stop sending you aid unless things change around here. This corrupt ruler had been more of a king than a president. He lived in this palatial estate with gourmet food and designer clothes and servants and expensive cars while his people lived in squalor. He couldn't really relate to their life because he lived in a man-made heaven while those that lived outside of the palace were in a man-made hell, a place of hunger and of crime and of disease. He lived such a different world than they did. He couldn't relate. Now, if you take a look at the stable, it has become for me a permanent symbol of the fact that God sent Jesus to live in a real world like us. He had no aristocratic, kingly privilege. In fact, Jesus' beginnings were probably more humbler than many of us. He was born into a poor family. He, he worked construction for 30 plus years. His hands were calloused. He had dirt under his fingernails. He had no chariot like earthly kings. Jesus walked everywhere. He had dust and calluses on his feet. Jesus lived in a real neighborhood. He had friends. He had enemies. He suffered hardships like the rest of us do. He died a cruel death for crime he didn't commit. The Bible tells us that when we are going through disappointment and pain, when you have that stuff going on in your life, you pour it out to Jesus. And we do that with absolutely assuredness that Jesus understands because he's literally been there. I think of Jesus sitting next to the right hand of the Father and somebody saying, oh, Lord, I'm going through a breakup in my relationship. It's really hard. And Jesus kind of nudging his dad and saying, I've been there. I know what that's like. I know what it's like when your friends despise you and hate you. I've been there. They need our help. He can relate to it. Jesus understands he's been there. Life without advantage, Jesus lived it. Financial hardship or poverty, Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. Discrimination, oppression, Jesus was a refugee before his first birthday. Rejection, he experienced it. Ridicule, part of his daily life. Abandonment, abandonment. When his friends left him at the moment he needed them the most, they were gone. He knows what it's like. He can relate. Death of a loved one, he lost his own father. He lost his friends. He went through it. Physical pain, he endured more than you and I can ever imagine. The amazing truth is this. Whatever is going on in your life that drives you to an inch of a breaking point, maybe that's where some of you are this morning, whenever you experience pain that you just want to cry out and say, I can't go on, nobody understands me, you look at the stable and be reminded that Jesus understands. He gets it. He's been there. He can identify with you no matter what you're going through. And you matter to him more than you can ever possibly imagine. It says in Hebrews 4.15 that since Jesus has been through everything we have, we can come boldly to the throne of God to find grace for help in our time of need. For me, when I look at the stable that Christ was born in, to me it symbolizes the deliberately unsheltered life of my Savior. It stands as a monument to his ability to identify with, to sympathize with whatever it is you and I are going through. He's been there. He knows. He understands. Hear me that say that today. The star... Stable, let's kind of zero down into that manger. And remember, the manger wasn't a first century bassinet. It was a far cry from that. It was, it was probably a, nothing more than a dirty feed trough for cattle. Maybe a, maybe a hollowed out rock. You could throw some feed in there for donkeys and cows. I'm saying that to people of Jesus' day. A manger is really a very ordinary thing. Man, just a rock hollowed out with some food in it for an animal. 
In fact, when you think about it, the only reason we're familiar with the term manger is because there's a small clip of scripture that mentions it. Jesus was placed in a manger. It's the only reason we understand it. Apart from that, I have no clue what a manger was. But because God's son was laid in a manger, look what happened to the ordinary piece of farm furniture. All of a sudden, it has new dignity. Now, manger is kind of a household world. The ordinary has become extraordinary. A feed trough for a stable has become the cradle for a king. And that's an incredible transformation. So if I look at the manger, I can see that it's a symbol of what can happen to an ordinary man, woman, boy, girl, when Jesus Christ resides inside of them. It's a symbol of what has happened to billions of people around the world and in this church. Ordinary people, average, run-of-the-mill, just people. Working, thinking, acting, relating people. Who one day saw themselves for who they were, lawbreakers in God's eyes. And they saw themselves as sinners or moral failures and they didn't hide from it. They admitted, this is who I am. And these ordinary people came to rejoice when they realized... They can't change their past record on their own. And they weren't going to be able to change their future conduct. In short, they were going to be standing guilty in front of a holy God one day. And they asked Jesus to rescue them. They asked Jesus to come into their hearts and live to dwell with them, much as he dwelt in the ordinary manger. And when they invited Jesus in, he came in just as he promised in Scripture. I will take res- I will reside with you. And when he did, those lives, my life, your life, were wonderfully transformed from the inside out. As Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 2 Corinthians 5.17 puts it this way. If anyone has Christ in them, they are a new, extraordinary creature. The old has passed away and the new has come. When Jesus takes up residence in an ordinary life, the ordinary gives way to the extraordinary. Just as in a feed trough became a a king's cradle, a very average man or woman can become exceptional through their responsiveness to our great God. I used to stutter, stutter when I was in school. I had to go to speech class because I couldn't speak. I'd get so excited I'd start stuttering. I never thought I'd be here. Where once there was a people pleaser, now we become concerned with giving God all the glory. Where once there was a selfish person, now there's a person who focuses life around loving and caring for others. These days, people don't know about the changes God can work in our lives because people rely on themselves. They do. It's the main reason the self-help industry is is exploding in growth. We're told that we can take our lives in our own hands, you know, be the captain of your own destiny, the master of your own ship. It's to agree, that's true. And partly that's true. We can do those things, right? We can absolutely make some personal changes, superficial external as they may be. We can lose some weight. We can learn a new language. Je m'appelle Brad. Merci beaucoup. Uh, we, can, we can learn these skills. We can, we can bleach our teeth. We can strengthen our abs. We can shorten our nose through plastic surgery. We can do all those things on the outside. But what about the inside? You see, the backwash of self-help is that many have discovered we are powerless to make significant changes, internal changes. Right? Changes in our marriage, changes in our parenting, in our habits, in our speech, in our attitudes, in our relationships. We can't make those changes on our own. It's only Jesus Christ working in us. The possible change is, is happening. God draws us. He, he does to humans what Jesus did to the manger. He comes into our lives and he takes that which was ordinary and makes it extraordinary. 
And as we focus in closing to that baby in the manger, wrapped, they say, in swaddling cloths. What's that? Well, in, in, in Middle Eastern times, people often travel long distances, which are hard and, and trouble-filled. And oftentimes, on those long journeys away from home, they never made it back. Sometimes your friends or companions would, would die. So all men carried this thin gauze-like that they would wrap around their waist just in case something happened to them or one of their friends that could take that thin gauze-like material and wrap the body in that, that cloth. So when Jesus was born, I'm sure Joseph said, a hot warm towels, please. Uh, no, we don't have any blankets. We have nothing. Joseph thought away, oh, I have this thin, these swaddling clothes I can unwrap to wrap my child in. And so the first outfit that Jesus wore was actually a death shroud. Jesus came to earth to rule, to reign, to love, to teach. But he also came to die for your and I's moral failures and our sin. It's the purpose of his coming. Or as the hymn says, to fit us for heaven to live with him there. He came to die for you. When I look at that star and I remember the travel guides that guided me closer to Jesus. I look at the stable and I remember that Jesus can relate to my pain and my suffering. He knows me. He can help me. When I look at that manger, I remember that Jesus coming into me has made me, in his words, in his words, a masterpiece. This ordinary guy, masterpiece. You, a masterpiece. And when I look at the child wrapped in a swaddling clothes, he came to die for me. And I don't ever want to get over that. I don't want you to either. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for these great hymns of the faith. We thank you for the scripture which tells us and describes this nativity scene. And God, as we focus in and drill down, we see all of those different aspects have incredibly significant meaning to each of us. So we pray, Lord, that we would remember, that we would be thankful that you have fit us for heaven to live with you there. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Won't you stand up as we sing another great hymn. What child is this? This. This is Christ the King. Come on, let's sing together.
That's some good stuff right there. Christmas Eve, this Friday, 7 o'clock. My message is about, oh, holy night. We're going to sing that song and we're going to celebrate together. I hope and pray you can make that here. 7 o'clock Friday, we'd love to see you be a part of that. We are not having, not having coffee hour after the service, which means of trying to keep folks safe. So I want to be in back. If you want to shake my hand, I'm probably going to say uh, elbow bump maybe, not get out of my way, but uh, we want to be safe. I want you to be safe and be well, be blessed this Christmas. If I don't see you, and I better see it. Merry Christmas, church. God loves you and I love you too. Thanks for coming.